I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Joe Berger is a professor of neurology within the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also the associate chief of the Division of Multiple Sclerosis. So I'd like to thank Dr. Berger for being here and for uh, speaking on this very timely and important issue. So um, I'll hand things over to Dr. Berger and we'll thank you in advance for your attention and questions. Thanks, Colleen. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Joe Berger and uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight are the neurologic complications of COVID-19, which has become an exceptionally topical issue. Uh, there isn't a day that goes by that the lay press doesn't have one, two, or three articles on how this virus can affect the brain or the nervous system in general. And I'll start with this quote by Sir William Osler, who, by the way, has ties to the University of Pennsylvania. Osler said, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, by far, the most terrible is fever. Now, COVID-19 is a coronavirus. We're going to talk more about that in a second. But it is an emerging infectious disease. And we sometimes think of emerging infectious diseases as things of the past. But that isn't true. And there's a very nice paper by Jones in Nature in 2008 that addressed the frequency with which emerging infectious diseases had been seen since 1940 through 2000. And what was found is that virtually every decade from 1940 on, as you see in this slide, there's an increase in the number of emerging infections that have been observed. They identified a total of 335. The majority of them were zoonoses. Zoonoses are infections that come from animals. Now, some of them come from domestic animals, but the majority of the emerging infectious diseases that came from animals, just like COVID-19, came from wildlife. Uh, about 50% came from bacteria or rickettsia, and the rest were chiefly uh, viral in nature. And most of these occur from various hotspots. So where are the hotspots? And this is a slide from that very paper that looks at the spots where these infections are emerging from. The coronavirus that we're dealing with emerged from central China in this region here. Uh, but we see that there are emerging infections that even come from the northeastern United States. Uh, some examples of emerging infections include things like West Nile virus, uh, SARS, MERS, other coronaviruses. Uh, there, there are many. And we're going to limit our uh, discussion today to coronavirus and COVID-19. So just to give you a little background on this virus, it first appears in Wuhan, China, which is located here, not that far from Shanghai. It's in central China. Uh, it is a population of 11 million people, and the transmission has been linked to an animal market in Wuhan, although there's some controversy as to whether that's the case or not. It turns out that the very first patient identified with this illness had no connection to the animal market at all. So whether the virus came from the animal market or not uh, remains controversial. Um, and th at the time of the Chinese Lunar New Year, they recognized this disease, by the way, uh, before the end of December. And they suppressed the information. The local authorities suppressed the information. And there are a lot of people that travel during the Chinese Lunar New Year it was estimated that 175,000 patients left Wuhan alone at the time of their Lunar New Year, which spread the infection before it was uh, widely identified to the, to, uh, the authorities. Uh, who was notified as of December 31st? That's the World Health Organization. And the virus was first isolated on January 7th, 2020. Interestingly enough, within three days, the virus had been sequenced and the sequence had been released. Now, one of the heroes of this story is a fellow named Li Wen Liang, who was an ophthalmologist in Wuhan. He recognized that people were developing this infection, this unusual infection. I think he was seeing patients because of conjunctivitis that often occurs in association with the infection and tried to alert the authorities. He actually also alerted his classmates through WeChat, this 
Chinese social media uh, website and uh, ultimately came under uh, suspicion by the authorities, was arrested, harassed, and ultimately ended up dying from the infection. Um, so these figures are a little old. They move every single day. This is from April 24th. But there were well over 100,000 cases reported in virtually every country in the world uh, by April, the end of April uh, 2020. And you see the distribution here. Uh, we are, in the United States, one of the hardest hits of all the nations. And as of May 8th, I didn't change this slide, but if you happen to listen to CNN, you know that this is this number of confirmed coronavirus cases in the United States. And that, by the way, is an underestimate is close to one and a half million. The number of deaths is well over 80,000. Um, so a very significant impact. Uh, the northeastern states, the Midwest states, Florida, Texas, and California uh, have had high rates, uh, but quite variable, New York obviously being the hardest hit. Is this a new virus? Well, this particular virus is a new virus, but coronaviruses we've known about for a long time. And in fact, Coronaviruses have been known to affect domestic animals for a long time, and there's actually coronavirus vaccines for dogs. So um, it's not as if we didn't know about coronaviruses. The first human coronavirus was identified in 1965 in a child who had an upper respiratory infection. And serologic surveys of individuals with upper respiratory infections suggest that as many as 1 to 35% of all upper respiratory infections are caused by a coronavirus. There are four genera of co coronaviruses. They fall into the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta genera. And there are at least seven identified human coronaviruses, with the most recent being the one that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so these are the seven coronaviruses. Three of them have caused epidemics, actually, in the case of COVID-2. It's caused a pandemic. CoV-1 and MERS has ca have caused epidemics. That is, they were more localized, not affecting the entire world. And these are the other human coronaviruses. I'll talk more about OC43 uh, as we go on. The two recent coronavirus epidemics before COVID-19 were the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, which was 2002 to 2003. About 8,000 people were infected, and the mortality rate with that disease was about 10%. So significantly higher than what we see with COVID-19. Uh, however, the R0 for that virus, that is the ability of that virus to be transmitted to other people, was less than with COVID-19. So as a consequence, it did not spread as rapidly as the COVID-19 virus has. The other recent coronavirus epidemic occurred in 2012, and that's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That started in Saudi Arabia. It affected about 2,500 people, and the mortality rate was even higher. It was about 35%. That virus, by the way, has not gone away. It is still present in the Middle East and does cause a handful of cases annually. The SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 viruses are all members of the beta genus of the coronavirus. The virus is an envelope virus with a positive sense single-stranded RNA genome. It has a helically symmetrical nucleocapsid, and the name corona comes from these viral spike peplomeres that are on the capsule that you see by electron microscopy. There are four structural proteins of the virus. There's a spike protein, which is that uh, virus uh, component for which corona is named. It's responsible for binding to the cell and for membrane fusion. There's a membrane protein, an envelope protein that's involved in cell death, a nucleocapsid protein which is involved with membrane fusion and RNA chaperoning. Uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 is referred to as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Why? Well, SARS-CoV-1, which caused SARS, is genetically the most related virus to it. And also, both of them use the angiotensin receptor type 2 for their cellular tropism. So these peplomeres on the virus 
attached to the angiotensin type 2 receptor. Now, prior to the virus entering the United States, there were already two strains identified in China, an L strain, which was the first, and an S strain. And the L strain apparently was one that was more pathogenic. The evolution of these coronaviruses, as I said earlier, they're zoonoses, they come from wildlife, and the wildlife, in the case of SARS, was the horseshoe bat. It too came from China, and it passed through an intermediate host. It, the intermediate host was identified, it was a civet. Uh, it too came from animal markets, so it was human consumption of wildlife, that, or its close proximity to this infected wildlife that led to human infection with this virus. And uh, it has this affinity for the ACE2 receptor located in the human lower respiratory tract, the airway epithelia and the type 2 pneumocytes. MERS, which comes out of Saudi Arabia, is derived from a virus that developed in the African uh, bat, this Neoromesia capensis bat, and then pass through the intermediate host of a camel. And there's still MERS in camels in the Middle East. And it too has an affinity for the lung, but does not use a, the ACE2 receptor as its binding site. COVID comes from a horseshoe bat uh, as well. What the intermediate host is remains uncertain, although it's been proposed that it is the pangolin. Now, you might think that if you figure out where ACE2 receptors are being expressed, you'd be able to figure out what tissues in the body are going to be affected. And the lungs express ACE2, and indeed the virus does bind to these tissues within the lung. And most of the problems we see are the consequence of lung disease, but not all. We find ACE2 receptors in oral and nasal mucosa. We find it in bone marrow and spleen. We find it in the skin. We find it in heart and arteries, adipose tissue, reproductive organs, and in the brain. And in the brain, you could find it in the thalamus, the inferior olive, the cerebellum, and in vascular endothelium. This is a picture of the spike protein and the spike protein binding to the ACE2 receptor as it binds to the cell membrane and then enters the cell, going through its replication cycle within the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, one would think that if you knew where the ACE2 receptors were, you could say, oh, uh, that therefore we're going to see infections in these organs. To date, there have been no cases of orchitis. As I said, the reproductive organs have ACE2 receptor, including the testes. There are no cases of orchitis reported with SARS. There are no cases of orchitis to date reported with COVID-19. So just because you express the receptor doesn't mean that the tissue is going to be involved. We do know that it can cause a myocarditis, um, and we've certainly seen problems with respect to oral and nasal mucosa, about which I'll have more to say. Now, unlike SARS-CoV-1 and 2, MERS uses a different binder, a binding site. It uses the CD26, otherwise known as DDP4, for its binding. And this uh, came from a very nice article of the Human Protein Atlas Map. Actually, it's a website. And what I'm attempting to show here is where the ACE2 receptor is most highly expressed in the brain. And what one sees is that it is most highly expressed in periventricular and brainstem tissue. So you find it in subfornical organs, the vascular organ and the lamina terminalis, the median eminence, the area post drama, the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, and the ventrolateral reticuli of the brainstem. It's been proposed that some of the respiratory problems in some people may be the consequence of the virus entering the brainstem, affecting the brainstem, and decreasing respiratory drive. That has not been demonstrated. That is simply hypothetical, and I think it's probably wrong or uh, if it occurs, has to be quite rare. So what are the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 prior to, uh, we'll talk about the neurologic in a second, but let's just talk about the general uh, uh, clinical manifestations. Firstly, it's not known, but it's believed that as many as 25 to 50% of infected people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Uh, 
There's some evidence for that because antibody studies that have come out in New York in the last week or the last two weeks have demonstrated that as many as 20% of the people in New York City and 15% of the people in the state of New York have been exposed to this virus. Yet, we've not recognized clinical illness in anywhere near that number. So this number of asymptomatic individuals may actually be higher than 50%. The symptoms typically develop after a median incubation period of four to 6.7 days. It may be somewhat shorter, it may be longer, and therefore the quarantining for 14 days when you've been exposed to somebody. The, um, clinical manifestations are virtually indistinguishable from influenza. So about 90% of people will have fever, cough is seen in about 50%, anosmia in 10 to 70%. It depends on the series you read. It appeared to be quite infrequent in China and far more frequent in Western Europe and the United States for reasons that aren't explained. 10 to 40% of people have headache, GI complaints are rare in adults. They're not uncommon in children. And this includes diarrhea, abdominal pain, chiefly diarrhea and abdominal pain. ARDS develops in a third of symptomatic patients. And an important um, point is that individuals can become severely hypoxemic in the absence of dyspnea. So, and I'm gonna come back to this because it is of relevance to the neurologic complications that you're going to see in individuals that are infected by COVID-19. So long before somebody realizes that there's something wrong with their lungs, they're finding it difficult to climb a flight of stairs or to complete a sentence because they're hypoxemic. Laboratory studies that are often observed, uh, laboratory abnormalities, I should say, that are often observed include lymphopenia, seen in greater than 80%, an increase in acute phase reactants, sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-10. Some of these can actually be found in cerebrospinal fluid, elevated chemokines and cytokines, and an increase in D-dimers and fibrin because the inflammation that is incurred triggers a, uh, a transformation of prothrombin to thrombin, uh, fibrinogen to fibrin, and a release of the coagulation cascade. This is what the lungs look like in a person with COVID-19, and there's this ground glass appearance on CT scan, highly characteristic, and in the series that have been published to date, of those individuals that are hospitalized with COVID-19, all of them have had abnormalities on CT scan of their chest. In fact, the Chinese, when they realized they had a problem, would put CT scans in their in the clinics, in these portable clinics that they developed, uh, evaluating large numbers of patients. And as people came in, they would run them through the CT scans. They do rapid CT scans to determine whether there was lung involvement or not. Now, one of the more interesting features of this disease are the skin manifestations. Uh, it may be due to the virus, it may be due to its involvement of the vascular system, or alternatively, it may be related to the hypoxemia that occurs. Chill glands. Now, I don't know how many of us are familiar with chill glands. Uh, after all, I suspect that most of us are neurologists, not dermatologists. But this is what it looks like, and it's this itching, burning sensation that one gets on these ruddy, complected toes. Often occurs in young patients, may be the only symptom of the disease. Vesicular eruptions have been seen, wheels, maculopapular eruption, levito reticularis, skin necrosis, and of course, blue lips uh, and blue uh, nail beds. And here's a picture of levito reticularis. So if you see patients with these skin manifestations and fever, in the absence of dyspnea, COVID-19 should come to mind. And there's recently been described in anybody who's been watching TV lately realizes this, a, a new syndrome in children. It was thought that children were relatively unaffected by COVID-19, but that doesn't appear to be the case. Well, let's put it this way. COVID-19 is unlikely to cause severe illness in children, but it may. And what's been recognized is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome that uh, mirrors Kawasaki's disease, but it doesn't cause the problems with the coronary arteries, apparently, that Kawasaki's disease does. 
And it occurs at the time that the infection has waned, and in some instances, weeks after the infection has been cleared. So it is probably an autoimmune phenomenon of some nature. Um, the exact pathogenesis remains uh, poorly understood. So I'm going to um, start out talking about neurologic problems. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to leave you with this thought by Lewis Thomas who said the microorganisms that seem to have it in for us turn out to be rather more like bystanders. It's our response to their presence that makes the disease. Our arsenals for fighting off bacteria are powerful. The, uh, we are a more danger from them than the invaders. And he said that in a book, or in an article rather, in a New England Journal entitled Germs in 1972. And with this disease, although we see a fair amount of damage and destruction as a consequence of the virus, the overwhelming problems that are occurring appear to be the consequence of an over-robust immune system affecting the lungs. Your viral titers are going down when you're developing this ARDS that ends up putting you on a, on a respirator, on a ventilator. Okay. So let's talk about what we know about the nervous system and coronavirus. There are four ways that coronaviruses have been demonstrated to get into the nervous system. One way is through olfactory epithelium. And these, by the way, were described long before the COVID-19 became a problem, long before it was ever recognized. So one way is through the olfactory epithelium. This shouldn't be surprising. There are other viruses that can do that. In fact, it's proposed that herpes virus infections can get in through the olfactory epithelium, get into the, the limbic system as a consequence of that. And there are actually animal models where you drip the herpes viruses into the nasal passages of mice and recapitulate herpes encephalitis. A second way is that they may infect monocytes and macrophages, and they may get into the brain and central nervous system through infected monocytes and macrophages. The third is that it simply crosses the endothelium. The endothelia of the brain does express ACE2 receptor. So it may simply be an ability of the virus to attach to the endothelium and cross into the brain that way. And the third, a fourth rather, that is not likely or not very common, I would imagine, but has been demonstrated is that you can infect peripheral nerves. So assume you have an open cut and the virus gets into the nerve, like rabies might get into a nerve. It can actually, trans, uh, it can actually be transmitted retrograde through the nerve into the central nervous system. Well, what do we know about neurologic disease with coronaviruses prior to the COVID-19 epidemic? So to begin with, there are at least two animals that have demonstrated they can develop encephalitis as a consequence of coronavirus infections. There's a porcine coronavirus that causes encephalitis in piglets. There's a murine coronavirus that causes limbic encephalitis in mice. And if you engineer mice to express human angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 receptor, uh, and then expose them to the SARS virus, that's SARS-CoV-1, not CoV-2, uh, you can cause neuronal death. It will get into cardiorespiratory centers of the medulla. And you'll see this elevation in cytokines and chemokines in the brain, but there's very little in the way of cellular inflammation in the brain. So it doesn't look like an overwhelming encephalitis. So you will get uh, an infection of the brain, not a lot of inflammation, and potentially involvement of cardiorespiratory centers. With respect to humans, uh, one of the earlier descriptions of neurologic disease was with this OC43. This is one of the seven human coronaviruses. It chiefly causes an upper respiratory infection, though there's at least one case report of the cerebrocerebellomyelitis. This is my term, not the article's term, but it was a patient who had brain, cerebellum, and spinal cord involvement in a child. That's the only case you could find with OC43. And with the other ones, apart from SARS and MERS, you don't find anything. However, it turns out that coronavirus has been detected in 12% of children who have acute encephalitis. 
And this data largely comes from studies like the study done in California uh, by the health administration there, where they took individuals with unknown causes of aseptic meningitis and looked hard for causes uh, like viruses, leptospirosis, et cetera, and concluded that maybe as many as 12% were related to coronavirus. SARS um, didn't uh, affect large numbers of people, neither did MERS. In that group, there were small numbers, very small numbers of people that had neurologic disease. What was reported were seizures in a handful, encephalopathy, encephalitis, one case, ischemic stroke, and Guillain-Barre. In Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, what was reported was seizures occurring in 8% of the patients, psychoses in about a quarter, one case of Bickerstaff encephalitis, one case of vasculopathy, one ADEM, and uh, a couple cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So um, I must say that neurologic disease was not an overwhelming manifestation of either SARS or MERS, not to say it couldn't occur. And some of the neurologic disease that was seen was really an autoimmune response, probably triggered by the virus, in terms of GBS and ADEM and GBS with MERS. And the ischemic stroke that one sees may have been the consequence of inflammatory disease. So once again, it's not as if neurologic disease was extraordinarily common. This is the case of meningitis encephalitis with SARS that, was, that you could find in the literature. This uh, was a 39-year-old man, a physician, who developed an encephalopathy and subsequent coma. This was his CT scan. They didn't have an MRI. There's some uh, areas of, of hemorrhage. There's diffuse brain swelling. And when he came to autopsy, he had necrosis with striated encephalomyelasia and SARS-CoV-1, as seen here and here, with the appropriate staining, was present in his brain. What are the neurologic complications of COVID-19? These can be divided into two separate areas. One are the consequences that occur as the direct effects of viral invasion. The other are the indirect effects. So let's talk about the direct effects, go through the list, and then we'll talk about the indirect effects, which by the way, are far more common than the direct effects, at least to date and in my experience. So, um, we know that anosmia is not infrequent. It can occur in up to 70% of people, but maybe the heralding manifestation. In fact, not only may you see anosmia, you may see a juicy as well. So the thought is that perhaps this is the consequence of direct viral invasion of the olfactory bulb. Uh, meningitis is a possibility. Uh, encephalitis and encephalopathy. Endothelial involvement may give rise to cerebral vasculitis, but to date, I'm unaware of any cerebral vasculitis case. Uh, myelitis, uh, we'll talk about this in a second. Peripheral nerve involvement, largely it looks like from Guillain-Barre syndrome, not from nerve involvement. And myalgias are extraordinarily common and myositis has been reported. So the bottom line is that any part of the norexis may be involved by the virus and by the direct effect of the virus. Although I'm going to posit that the likelihood of this occurring, with the exception of the anosmia, which is quite common, is probably pretty rare. The indirect effects. So the commonest is hypoxia, at least uh, in, the, in my experience where I've been asked to consult on patients who've had COVID-19 and neurologic problems. It looks like hypoxia and hypoxic ischemic damage to the brain is the likeliest uh, uh, and most common of all the causes. There are cytokine storms that are elicited by the viral, by the uh, immune response to the virus. And cytokine storms can cause encephalopathy. They can also cause an entity called acute necrotizing hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis. Encephalitis, and I'm gonna show you a case in which that happened. It can trigger a hypercoagulable state and strokes have been observed. Metabolic abnormalities are clearly seen apart from the hypoxia. And post-infectious autoimmune disorders are now being recognized, including Guillain-Barre, uh, of which there are at least a dozen in the literature. 
I'm aware of at least two cases of Miller-Fisher syndrome and acute disseminated encephalomyelite. Now, these are post-infectious complications. They're probably not that much more common than what occurs following influenza. We just have our antenna up right now, and we have very large numbers of patients that are infected, and that's why we're now recognizing these syndromes. So the earliest um, attempt to categorize the neurologic manifestations comes from Chinese investigators in Wuhan. They divided up the neurologic symptoms into three categories, DNS disease, PNS disease, and musculoskeletal disease. They analyzed 214 patients, and they concluded that a third of the patients had neurologic manifestations, and that the people that had more severe disease more commonly had neurologic manifestations. The commonest were dizziness, headache in 13%, altered uh, level of consciousness in 7%, Stroke in 3%, uh, 5% had ajusia, 5% had hyposmia. And by the way, you can have hypojusia without hyposmia or hyposmia without hypojusia. Hypopsia, uh, neuralgias in 2% and muscle injury in 10%. Seizures were seen in less than 1% and ataxia in less than 1%. Now, I'll just draw your attention to the following. Muscle injury was loosely defined and who hasn't had the flu and had severe muscle aches and pains and probably a little elevation of their CKs? Who hasn't had the flu and had headache? I mean, just because you have headache doesn't mean that you have a meningitis or an encephalitis. And who hasn't had the flu and had dizziness or for that matter, a change in your taste or smell? So these are quite nonspecific and don't necessarily um, imply that the virus has directly affected these components of the nervous system. With respect to anomia and, and anosmia, rather, and ajusia, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's frequently been observed. It's often the heralding manifestation. They may occur independently, that is, loss of taste without loss of smell, and loss of smell without loss of taste, <clears throat> though they generally occur together. Now, the interesting thing, and this comes from a paper re recently uh, uh, uploaded, it's, it's been submitted for publication, you do not find the ACE2 receptor on olfactory neurons. They're not there. It's on these olfactory epithelial cells that are the support cells uh, that you find the ACE2 receptor. So it may be that those are the cells that are infected. That's not to say that the virus still can't enter the nervous system, though. Um, this is one of the uh, earliest cases of a meningitis encephalitis, and I use that term hesitatingly. This is a case from uh, Boca Regional Medical Center in uh, South Florida of an older man who developed altered mental status and an altered level of consciousness, which may be the heralding manifestations. If you take an elderly person and you drive their oxygen saturation down to 50, and trust me, there are individuals coming to the emergency room without dyspnea who have very little in the way of symptoms. They, ju they just feel crappy and they think they might have it, whose oxygen saturations are 50. I mean, it's unbelievable. They don't have dyspnea. But if you were to take an elderly person, you take me, and drive my saturations down to 50, I guarantee I will be goofy. So it's not that unlikely that the abnormal mental status that people are presenting with that has been attributed to direct viral infection of the brain has nothing to do with direct viral infection of the brain, but is rather the consequence of, of, of hypoxemia superimposed on an aging brain. Um, in this particular instance, the patient had an encephalopathy without any signs of inflammation. There was no CSF pleocytosis. The SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR in the spinal fluid was negative. He presented with severe hypoxemia. And in fact, uh, I'm in the process of helping. These are some of my former trainees uh, from Kentucky when I was the chair in Kentucky um, who migrated down to South Florida. And uh, we're in the process of writing up their experience. And I will tell you that of all the cases that have had cause for neurologic consultation at that hospital, every single one of them has had a problem with either hypoxemia, 
or a hypoxic ischemic event that has caused brain damage uh, and not viral infection of the brain. Now, there's something else that's been uh, reported. I've not really seen it in the refereed literature, and that's a hyperarousal state that has been reported by um, individuals that are attempting to intubate patients and realizing that they need large amounts of sedating drugs in order to sedate them. And that is an interesting observation. I don't know what it's due to, but it raises the question of whether or not there's an involvement of the reticular activating system by the virus. Here's a case that's a little more uh, uh, compelling with respect to maybe it's related to SARS-CoV-2. So this is a case report from Wuhan of a 24-year-old man had fever, headache, fatigue. On day nine of the illness, his Glasgow coma scale was six and he had generalized tonic-clonic convulsions. His CT scan was negative, but his MRI, as you see here, showed diffusion restriction in the inferior temporal lobe and abnormal flare and atrophy of the right temporal lobe. And uh, CSF showed 12 cells, 80% monocytes, and the PCR of the spinal fluid did reveal SARS-CoV-2. So it's possible that this is related to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2. This is a case that has gotten a lot of press. A patient with acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalitis. She was an airline worker living in Detroit, a woman in her late 50s, who develops cough, fever, and altered mental status, is confirmed to have COVID-19. They do a lumbar puncture. There are no pathogens, but they don't test it for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the CT scan, as seen here, shows this hypoattenuation of bilateral medial thalami. Uh, and then when they do the MRI, they see this enormous involvement of the thalami and uh, hemorrhage. I wouldn't say that it's ring enhancing, that's what they called it, but it doesn't look like ring, ring, ring enhancing. In any event, they labeled this acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalitis which is, I think, it certainly fits with that disease. Um, this is the consequence of not the virus, but of the cytokine storm caused by the virus. So acute necrotizing encephalopathy was a term first proposed by Mizuguchi in 1995. It's typically preceded by a viral illness. Influenza and HHV6 are the most common viral illnesses, but you can see it with many viral illnesses. It has a global distribution, though the first reports were in Taiwan and Japan. There are probably, uh, it probably occurs as a combination of both host and environmental factors. There's a cytokine storm that leads to the, the hemorrhagic necrosis. It's a sporadic disease that's non-recurrent. However, on occasion, it may be recurrent and familial. And when it is recurrent and familial, it occurs in an autosomal dominant pattern and it's related to this RAN binding protein type 2, a genetic abnormality. The hallmark is the neuroradiology, the multifocal symmetric brain lesions involving the thalamus, although some of these cases don't involve the thalamus. Here's a more typical case. This was one of the Penn cases, 41-year-old man, hypertension, diabetes, prior right middle cerebral artery infarct, uh, develops COVID with ARDS shock, acute kidney injury and pulmonary uh, and, uh, and a PEA arrest, a pulseless electrical event. And he's evaluated for persistent stupor, grimaces with nail bed pressure. And the damage, it almost looks watershed here. Uh, the damage really has occurred as a consequence of a hypoxic ischemia. So there are multiple bilateral foci of diffusion signal uh, superimposed on that chronic right MCA stroke. And, some microvascular changes. There are no brainstem abnormalities seen. Stroke is a not uncommon problem with COVID-19. Uh, it's reported in 2.88% of patients. It may be the presenting manifestation of COVID-19. So these days, if you see a young person with a stroke, come into your emergency department, check their temperature, check them for COVID-19. Often the stroke is a large vessel ischemic stroke in a young person. 
uh, hemorrhagic strokes may be observed in the Wuhan experience of 221 patients, 5% had acute ischemic stroke, 0.5% had cerebral venous thrombosis, and 0.5% had cerebral hemorrhage. <clears throat> now, the ischemic strokes are from hypercoagulation, and the hypercoagulation is likely to have been elicited by the infection, which then triggers this uh, fibrinogen to fibrin uh, and, and the entire coagulation cascade. However, it is certainly conceivable, given the fact that ACE2 receptor is found on endothelial tissue, that the virus has induced a vasculitis and that may be contributory. And viral myocarditis has been reported as well. So one has to rule out the possibility of embolic stroke. In some regions, it is not uh, uncommon to have the patient who is about to be admitted to the intensive care unit with COVID uh, be anticoagulated with heparin or heparin-like substance. And this comes from the New England Journal. There's a paper recently published of five young individuals with large vessel strokes. They came from Mount Sinai. There were four men, one woman. They ranged in age from 33 to 49. Two of them had no symptoms of COVID when they first presented with stroke, and one of them had only lethargy. So the majority of people, at least in this series, really didn't have symptoms that would suggest to you that they had COVID. There's one case of acute myelitis I'm aware of. It's a 66-year-old man from Wuhan who presented with fever and fatigue. He had a mild case of COVID. Five days after symptom onset, he developed weakness and incontinence. The exam revealed upper extremity weakness, three over five, lower extremity, zero over five, and a T10 sensory level with absent lower extremity reflexes. A CT scan showed lacunar infarcts of the basal ganglia and brain atrophy. They did not do MRIs. They did not look at spinal fluid. And at the time of discharge, 14 days later, his upper extremity strength was four over five, and his lower extremity strength is one over five. Now, the problem with a lot of these cases that you're going to find in the literature is that they end up being published in uh, online citations that have not been appropriately vetted. It's hard to say whether this is actually due to the virus, it's an autoimmune phenomenon, or that it's unrelated entirely and that it was just true, true and unrelated. This is a case from New Jersey, also found online, of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis in a New Jersey female who's in her early 40s. <clears throat> 11 days prior to admission, she had headache and myalgia. Two days prior to admission, she had dysphagia, dysarthria, and encephalopathy. Her temperature was 102.2, she was hypoxemic, she had trouble speaking, and she had an expressive aphasia as well. She had a right gaze preference with a mild left facial weakness and mild decreased global strength, and her spinal fluid was normal. And this was her MRI. Now, I will tell you that if this is sent to me for review, because it's published in a non-referee journal and it's about to be sent, I imagine, when it's cleaned up to a respectable journal, I would say, I'm not so sure this is ADEM. I mean, this doesn't necessarily look like ADEM to me. And how do I know it's not hypoxic ischemic? So to date, as I mentioned, there are a few cases of Guillain-Barre reported with COVID. We saw Guillain-Barre with SARS and MERS. There's no reason we shouldn't see it with COVID-19. The weakness preceded the onset of systemic symptoms by eight days in at least one case. So that's unusual. I mean, we usually think of Guillain-Barre as something that develops after the infection, not before the infection. In the other cases, it was five to 10 days after symptoms. There are at least two cases of Miller-Fisher syndrome uh, that I'm aware of. And the CSF is generally acellular with an albuminocytologic dissociation. So uh, one of the concerns, and I imagine that most of the people on the call are a neurologist, uh, I will tell you, when COVID became a problem, we were getting 30, 40 calls a day from MS patients saying, oh my God, you know, I'm on teriflunamide, I'm on cladribine, I'm on natalizumab, I'm on ocrelizumab, uh, I'm freaking out. What should I do? And we thought about it, and we ultimately ended up writing a paper about it that's coming out in neurology, neuroimmunology, and neuroinflammation. But the thought was that there... While there is a risk of infection with some of these drugs, there's no evidence that 
there is an influenza signal with any of them. Uh, there may be a slight risk of upper respiratory infections with the anti-CD20s, but there's really nothing to suggest that they're at high, great increased risk for coronavirus infections. And furthermore, as I mentioned early in this talk, the problem isn't the damn virus, the problem is your body responding to the virus and this overwhelming immune response. And guess what? The drugs that we employ dampen the immune response. So in today's Wall Street Journal, for those of you that read the Wall Street Journal, there was an article by Peggy Weinmeier, who is being treated by Elliot Froman for her MS. She admits it in the article, so I'm not revealing anything that she hasn't revealed. And Elliot mentions to her that methotrexate's going to shut down COVID-19. It'll shut off the inflammation, and that if you combine remdesivir with methotrexate, you shouldn't have any problems. I don't know whether that's true or not, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, the point is that some of these uh, drugs that we employ in multiple sclerosis likely have a salutary effect. I'm aware of one study in China looking at fingolimod in the treatment of uh, COVID ARDS. Uh, and I will tell you that there's no evidence of a signal in this population to date. So most of the deaths have occurred in older patients with multiple comorbidities and advanced disease, and the majority of them haven't even been on DMTs. So just the people you'd expect to die, die. We've created registries. Uh, the Penn MS group is involved in two registries, one with a group of other Northeastern schools and another that's nationwide. And there are registries from every one of the European countries. So this is the Penn experience. Uh, and I thank my colleague Chris Perone for this data with COVID-19 in MS. So as of May 8th, I think we're probably up to 40 patients now. This is last week's data. We had 32 patients with proven or suspected COVID. This is probably an underestimate. We have close to 7,000 patients in our practice. 20 of them had RRMS, five had SPMS, five PPMS, two clinically isolated syndrome. The mean age was 53. Uh, the gender was overwhelmingly female, 26 versus 6. Uh, comorbidities included diabetes, hypertension, and asthma, and 15 were smokers or former smokers, I should say, and 17 non-smokers. Uh, uh, 12 of them were on no medications, which is, I think is unusual because uh, I have very few patients that are not on something. 11 of them were on ocrelizumab. Now you'd say, well, that's got to be an overrepresentation of ocrelizumab. In fact, in our practice, it isn't. Uh, we use a large amount of ocrelizumab. So this is probably reflective of our practice in general. Uh, maybe a bit overrepresented, but not by much, I suspect. Uh, two had teriflunamide, one each natalizumab, cladribine, fingolimod, DMF, the interferons, and glutamorastate. By the way, there's some data that the interferon betas may be helpful. Mind you, the interferon betas are what is elaborated at the time you first see COVID-19 because it is a novel infection to you. You've not seen it before. So what's triggered is the innate immune system, not the adaptive immune system. And therefore, NK cells get activated. Uh, the virus gets uh, uh, processed in dendritic cells. And there's this elaboration of the interferons. Uh, the alpha and beta interferons, which are antiviral. So um, there is some evidence that there may be some efficacy of the interferon. Um, there were seven hospitalizations. Uh, the average age was 65. These were the drugs that they were on. Four ended up on ventilators, uh, or four ended up in the ICU, three on ventilators, and one patient with SPMS uh, who was on nothing uh, died. So it's not very different than what you'd expect to see in the population at large. I threw this in as a filler. We don't have any evidence for long-term neurologic sequelae. I give a talk entitled Post-Encephalitic Parkinson's. Actually, it's called Von Economos Encephalitis, which is post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease. Remember, that occurred contempor almost contemporaneous with the flu pandemic of 1918. Now, the best evidence is that it was not due to the flu, that it was a separate infection that caused 
bonychondromatous encephalitis, and that's for another time. However, um, the concern is is that maybe some patients have had subtle viral infection of structures within the brainstem, and may we see abnormalities arise later on as a consequence. Only time is going to tell. So these are my final thoughts. Neurologic manifestations are common with COVID-19. Uh, any part of the neuraxis may be affected. The direct effects of the virus on the CNS and the PNS are likely rare. So though neurologic manifestations are common, most of them are occurring as the indirect consequence of the virus, chiefly the hypoxia that we've seen. The most most neurologic manifestations are the consequence of these secondary manifestations, hypoxemia, the systemic inflammatory uh, response, a cytokine storm, and hypercoagulability. As with other infections, COVID-2 can trigger autoimmune disease, so we've seen GBS, we've seen Miller-Fisher syndrome, and we've seen, or at least somebody thinks they've seen ADEM. And I'm gonna leave you with two final slides. There's this Facebook group that I joined. It's the only Facebook group I've ever joined. Um, it's a Russian group called Izo, Izoli, H-E-I, -I, I don't know how, how it's pronounced. But in any event, what people do is, uh, now that they have time on their hands, they find a painting that they like, and they try to recapitulate it in the time that they have on their hands, in their homes, and then they photograph themselves. So here's a guy who photographed himself uh, mirroring the Death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David, uh, painted in 1793 at the height of the French Revolution. And what he's written here is uh, COVID Matue. He, he misspelled the Tue, but that's okay. He, he gets the right idea. And I'll leave you with this thought by Marcus Tullius Cicero. Uh, unfortunately, it's not one that's shared by our president, who said, Salus populi suprema lex esto. The health of the people must be the highest law. And I'll leave it at that and uh, take any questions, Colleen. Is Thanks, Dr. Berger. That was a really content rich presentation. Um, so thank you for all that information. I have a question um, from, from one of our call in attendees who just texted me this. So thank you for asking a question even though you can't be on uh you know on video um so the question is just maybe and maybe it's too early to know but maybe just your opinion on let's say i'm a neurologist or a primary care physician who's meeting a new patient for the first time and they've had a prior history of covid19 and they're coming in complaining of neurological symptoms that have um either presented new or have been exacerbated after their COVID diagnosis. Do you have any recommendations on things to look out for, things to suggest, especially in the outpatient space? Yeah, I'm not sure what necessarily is going to be aggravated. I, I imagine as with any viral infection and MS, that we will see people have MS exacerbations in the, uh, during the time of the viral infection. But after the virus has passed, I'm not quite sure what neurologic manifestations one might have. I did have a, I did see a patient in consultation last week who had a stroke. She was a young nurse who uh, was actually sent to me because the thought was that maybe she had a, an unusual presentation of MS. And it looked to me like she had had a stroke and that had occurred on the heels of uh, a viral illness with fever and cough. She had been tested for COVID, it was negative, but I still think that it, not unlikely because she had no stroke risk factors that she had COVID and was hypercoagulable and I'm um, trying to get the antibody test on her. It's, it's still very difficult to get these tests, the, both the COVID uh, PCR and the antibody test, so I don't know how successful I'll be. I, I'm not sure how to answer uh, that person though. Uh, I'm not sure what it is that we would, we would see. Great, thank you. And you, and in answering that question, you just answer, you just answered my next question. But maybe if you want to elaborate on it, you can. Um, there was just a question about whether COVID um, will exacerbate MS symptoms. So it sounds like you already answered that. But if you had anything else to add, um, well, that well all I can say is um, I don't know. Uh, 
all any infection can aggravate MS and create an exacerbation. So it would be reasonable to think that COVID does that. However, uh, in the half dozen or so patients of mine that have had COVID, maybe 10 patients, and of the others that are in the Penn Clinic that we are monitoring, none of them have reported an exacerbation at the time of their COVID. So uh, I guess we'll just have to see what comes out of the registries. Thank you, and I think that makes more of the point for those MS patients to continue with their infusions, would you say? I know that you talked Absolutely. about that a little bit earlier. Absolutely. I, I so the recommendation is not to change a damn thing. If they're scheduled for infusions, let them get their infusions. Now, there are some exceptions to that, and that is there's a drug called alemtizumab, which causes a profound reduction in lymphocytes that last for months afterwards. And uh, I would be reluctant to start alemtizumab or to give the second dose of alemtizumab in, 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 at this time because of the pandemic, only because of the risk uh, of infection occurring at the time they were severely lymphopenic. Similarly with cladribine, although the reduction in lymphocytes is, in, is profound and it comes back quicker, uh, I might be a little reluctant to start cladribine at this point in time, although I think it, it's probably not much of a problem. Uh, nonetheless, we're, I'm still a little reluctant to do so. And then lastly, I've also held off starting uh, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody in individuals who have primary progressive multiple sclerosis, who I diagnose with primary progressive multiple sclerosis, I'd like to put them on it. I'm planning on putting them on it. But because I don't think it has that profound an effect on the disease course, uh, what I've told them is, why don't we just wait until the pandemic wanes and we'll start you afterwards. But everybody else, I go with uh, the game plan. That's great. Thank you. So I think we're at 631 right now. So I believe we are at time. We do have a couple more specific questions that we might be able to answer one on one after the fact. Um, but unless Dr. Berger, if you have any other closing thoughts, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this evening. Uh, no, I'm glad everybody had an opportunity to attend and uh, I hope I've enlightened them in some way. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for all of our attendees for joining us this evening.